So cut and crack and drug routing balloon. This is the way we are treating um, our patients in Lucerne. Um, first, before we talk about cut and crack, I think we always need to speak about lesion preparation and speak why PCI fails. And um, of course, then I will show you some cases um, and, and then we can have a discussion about that. Uh, this is an old slide, which I really like to show um, because I think before we speak about different drugs, uh, if it's Sirolimus or Paclitaxel, which is important, we have to speak about mechanics. And PCI fails when you have a chronic total occlusion and you treat it, uh, when you have a long lesion, when you have a small diameter, um, this, and when you have an instant restenosis. This is, this is the, um, the, the topic which we have to address. And besides diabetes, all other all factors um, are mechanical, and this hasn't really changed in the last uh, 20 um, more years. We learned when, um, how to implant stents and how to prepare the lesion when we did this study, which was a study which unfortunately did not receive a lot of attention um, um, because also the design could have been better. But what we saw here, this is just briefly, we did a study where we randomized 50 to 50 patients, semi-compliant or non-compliant balloon for lesion preparation. And we did OCT after stent implantation, and you can see here the difference was not really significant. So independently, if you, if you predate it with a non-compliant or semi-compliant balloon, when you implant a stent, the difference was not really major. But then when you post-dilate it, uh, you see that you achieve a significant difference. So the patients who were pretreated with a um, non-compliant balloon benefited from post-dilatation, but only those really benefited who were who were who were pretreated with a non-compliant balloon, but not those who were pretreated with a semi-compliant balloon. So lesion preparation pays off, and this study basically demonstrated that you have to do aggressive lesion preparation and good post-dilatation in order to achieve optimal stent expansion. The problem is that when we use drug balloons, we don't really have the chance to do post-dilatation. So we have to even take more care about lesion preparation. And that's why I showed this slide. Now, when you do lesion preparation and you have a calcified lesion, like in this case, which is really not a very thick calcium ring you see here, but if you use the wrong balloon, then you will dissect the vessel and your dream of putting a, um, a, a drug routing balloon uh, will end up uh, because you will need a stent to cover this. Now, how did we learn to, uh, to combine cutting balloon and non-compliant or highly non-compliant balloon like the OPM um, in our hospital? We learned to combine this with a calcified lesion. And this was about two years ago. Uh, we had just discovered uh, the um, Wolverine uh, um, cutting balloon. We had a lot of experience with um, um, the OPN balloon for many years. So this was a, not a very difficult lesion, but I felt that uh, when I looked at this, I said, why don't we just um, combine cut and crack in this case? And this, is, this was the lesion. As you can see here, it's uh, highly calcified. In... Um, with a bit of aneurysmatic pitch, we thought, and then we, you see the second part also very highly calcified. Now, back then, I did not, I would not have even dreamed of treating this lesion with a drug eluting balloon, I have to say, because it's highly calcified. And I thought I need a stent. And I even putting a stent, I said, I said, I really need to do this very, uh, very well. Uh, as you can see, you can see here the calcium. And then I use the trio balloon cutting a Wolverine, a 3.5 NC balloon, uh, OPN at 30 atmospheres, then I put two stents and post dilated. Now, what I saw here that is that the effect of the cutting balloon was actually impressive. The calcium in this case was not very thick. And I said, aha, I can cut the calcium and, and then I can maybe flatten it with a non-compliant balloon, with a highly non-compliant balloon. So I thought, oh, this is actually good. With one, uh, I can prepare the lesion um, just halfway, and then with the other balloon, with the open and see, I can really create lumen. Uh, so this was basically the birth of the idea 
to use this principle for drug dumping balloons. In this patient, as you can see, the result was good with the stent and he hasn't come back now for two years. So I hope he's still doing fine because it looks good. And as you can see also, um, it looks good on OCT, but we put a very long stent. This was a something Dr. Bossard would call a longo in our hospital because it's a long stent. Now, why do I believe or do we believe that it is a good idea to combine drug uh, to combine cutting and cracking with drug eating balloon? Um, I think it's it's good for many reasons. One, I said it's the mechanical part of it. So the I believe or the experience we have made so far is that when we combine it this way, and I will show you cases, um, that then the lesion is less likely to dissect. I was moderating a case of Dr. Colombo yesterday for whom I have big respect, but he was using uh, semi-compliant balloons at high pressure to do lesion preparation, which surprised me a lot because then the archery was completely dissected. Of course, Colombo can afford to leave it just like that with many dissections and not put a stent, but only Colombo can afford that, not, not Dr. Tsutsuli in Lucerne. So our philosophy is really to cut first with a rather undersized Wolverine and then crack it with a bigger open and balloon, but with less pressure. So we do the opposite what we do in calcified lesions when we go, uh, where, where I say use a downsize the diameter of the balloon and upsize the pressure to crack the calcium. In this setting, we do the different. So we use um, uh, appropriately sized opium balloon to create lumen, and we use a rather undersized balloon to really cut it and use it at high pressure. Now, this is a bifurcation case, but it's um, um, a very interesting one, because as you can see, this is a, um, a, a LED bi diagonal bifurcation, um, and it's a, a bifurcation you, you are, which, which you usually could find a lot of people who would put two stents here. The problem is the patient's 38. So this patient is 38. We, we um, diagnosed this on CT. As you can see, he has some chronic disease, also the left main, which we did. I was and it was fine. So how do we treat this LED diagonal bifurcation? Here, another picture. So it's clearly significant. The patient has symptoms. We have to treat it. But do we really want to put a stent in a 38-year-old man? Now, how did I treat? I used a 3.25 Wolverine balloon at 25 atmospheres. Um, and then I did OCT. And as you can see, and I will show you the full OCT run, and the vessel in the distal bit, this is now the OCT after um, using a 3.25 balloon. And as you can see, the vessel distally looks pretty OK. And now we are coming to the interesting bit and you will see what you always see when you do intravascular imaging you, with OCT, you will see a dissection. Uh, and you see it here. And what you also can see is, although if we use a three to five balloon, the lumen is still not very large. So now putting a balloon uh, like a solution here, and yes, you can see angiographically as well, it's really not, it's not there yet. It's much better than in the beginning. The patient might be symptom-free. Colombo would do a FFR and see it's fine, but I was not happy. I want to be uh, not better than Colombo, but better for the patient. So what we did here, I continued with a 3.5 opium balloon and I went to 26 atmospheres, which is rather high, but the lesion was not inflating. And I said, I, it's a young man. I want to have a good result. If it works with a balloon, yes, fine. Otherwise I'll put a stent. Uh, and then I had to take care, of course, about this diagonal, because as soon as I tried, as I pressed the, the uh, LED, the diagonal was insulted. Then I went into the diagonal. I, I opened it up with a small balloon, used a 2.0 solution balloon for the diagonal, just just um, um, to be, but did not intend to kiss. And I said, I will make a compromise maybe on the diagonal rather than the LED. And then I used a 3.520 solution balloon for the LED, which, we, which I inflated really at... Uh, four or five atmospheres, very low pressure, because it's a semi-compliant balloon. I don't want to dissect, to dissect the vessel. Now, this is the result uh, on OCT, the final result. And as you can see, the, also angiographically, the LED has, has become um, bigger. Let's just go here. Yes, the LED has become bigger. And now we are coming in this um, uh, region of the LED. And I'll stop it here. Now, of course, you sorry. Of course, you will see a dissection, 
um, here, but it's not a really major dissection, I felt. So we left it as it is. Here, um, you can see what I what was the difference between the lesion when it, when I used just a Wolverine balloon three to five, and then the luminal gain you achieve with the opium balloon three five, which I went to very high pressure. You can see the luminal gain is massive, um, with with just 0.25 more of diameter and a different balloon. And I think this is a very important message. Balloon choice matters. It's not. I, I'm fed up of hearing people say, well, it's always all balloons are the same. Well, no, they are not. They are not lesion preparation. You should really know your balloons and then um, how to apply them. Now, this is what it looked like angiographically at the end of the procedure. You can see the LED does not look perfect at that region, but I felt it's okay. Now, if I insist, then I will dissect it and then I will have to use a stent. And I wanted to bring the patient back and I brought him back after three months. And this is what it looks like after three months. So you can see the LED is patent. Um, it's look, it looks even a little bit better than, than in, the, in the initial angiogram. And from our experience, and we are now using solution since about one year or so, uh, um, is that if your initial result is good and your short-term follow-up is good, usually it stays good. And this is what we are learning now. So this is the final result. Now, Matthias will speak, Dr. Bossar will speak about CTOs, but with the same principle, this is a different patient um, with a CTO of the circumflex, which we uh, treated with cut and crack with uh, a 2.5 opium balloon and a 2.5 uh, uh, cutting balloon and a 3.0 opium balloon. And as you can see, and then the drug routing balloons were 2.5 and 3.0, so um, rather conservative as well. Uh, and very low pressure, and you can see after six months, it looks good. So if it looks good acutely, then usually it stays good. So um, I think lesion preparation is still a matter of discussion, and I think it's still a matter of discussion even for drug looting stents, because everyone is doing differently, and we don't really have guidance for this. And, and this is a bit something which is a pity, because it's such an important matter, and we have guidance for everything else, but we have no guidance for lesion preparation. Um, however, I think for drug routing balloons, it's even more open because nobody really knows how to prepare the lesion well in order to achieve a good result in the short and long term. And then the second is cut and crack has allowed us to treat more patients with drug routing balloons in Lucerne. And we have really uh, our, our number of, of or percentage of, of uh, drug routing balloons usage have, has increased massively. And I think one of the reasons for that is because we have learned, the, we have always had the idea to use drug routing balloons, but using the appropriate approach to do lesion preparation is what has changed or what has enabled us to use it more. And in our experience um, with the solution SLR, um, I think the results are promising also in the long term. And uh, we are glad that uh, one of our abstracts uh, with our all commerce population was accepted DCT and uh, Dr. Bosser will present this uh, very soon and hopefully live in, uh, where is it? I don't know, in San Diego or so, let's see. Okay, thank you uh, very much for your attention and maybe um, we have some questions from your side. Thank you, Florian, for this beautiful presentation. Uh, what you showed is just coming back to the origin of the uh, interventional cardiology to the plain balloon angioplasty. However, you showed uh, clearly uh, how to control how to control the most important problem of the angioplasty. How to control the dissection. And this is how uh, you showed you showed how to cut the artery and then open it widely. And this is always stent, what we called uh, in the previous uh, ten years, twenty years ago, a stent-like result. So this is yeah because because uh, well. Uh, 
20 years ago, I can remember we had only Palmas shot stands that we had to cut with the scissors. And that was uh, one stand for two people. Uh, however, we always uh, tried to use the long inflations of the balloons uh, to uh, heal the dissection or to control the dissection with first with a small inflation with low pressure, then higher, higher, higher. And then we learned from IVUS that we should use bigger balloons to uh, open widely the artery to get uh, the better results without stent. So this is a great concept. I co congratulation. This is uh, this is uh, the fascinating concept for me. Thanks a lot. Maybe some other comments. Um, yeah, from... brief question. It was a, it was a great presentation. In your experience. Uh, what is the ballpark figure in terms of uh, flow limiting dissection? Because we are sometimes uh, worried when we use Wolverine cutting balloon, we don't uh, seem to go at very high pressure and you seem to be uh, applying high pressure as well. So in your experience, uh, what is the risk? Uh, because uh, obviously we were, we were trying to limit the dissection and at the same time we want to do one to one dilatation of the lesion to give uh, to provide better result with the drug eluting balloon well i think it's very important that um i think the lesion needs to be cracked if you don't crack the lesion then you will uh, it's useless to use a balloon or a stand because then it's not the result long term is not going to be good so what we are trying to achieve um, and I really uh, do this, and you will hear from from Dr. Bossart because we are we are. Uh, you won't find a second place in Switzerland discussing so much about lesion preparation and how to prepare. So you can imagine it, you know, it takes sometimes twenty minutes before we decide which balloon to use because we discuss how the size and this is it, it's done with a lot of a lot of love, I would say. So um, what. I think with the Wolverine balloon, it's important not to oversize the balloon. If you oversize the balloon, then you will dissect even with a lower pressure. However, we try to have the balloon open and we, we try to have angiographically an appropriate result so that we have the feeling the lesion is cracked. The lesion does not have to be perfect after the Wolverine because we are doing this with the opium balloon. And with the OPN, then we go with size and try to, to gain lumen. So with the, with the Wolverine balloon, we are trying to really just prepare the lesion for the OPN. And the second interesting effect, which I did not mention in my presentation, which we cannot prove, but I think by creating a bit of dissections, and you always have dissections, you will, you will have dissection even with other balloons, and um, we try to, to create those scripts for the balloon for the drug entrance but this is this is something we, we don't know how much uh, more we do than compared to other balloons but the concept is really to undersize the the the, the balloon uh, the wolverine and sometimes it works and honestly sometimes it doesn't sometimes it just dissects and then you have to put a stent but very often it works and it works more and more and more with time because we learn and become better Maybe let me just add one more point there. I think um, there is that recommendation from this uh, consensus paper, which has recently been published in Jack Interventions by the uh, Consortium of Interventional Cardiologists focusing on drug-coated balloons in PCI. And they actually recommended there to size one-to-one -one, um, for lesion preparation and drug-coated balloons. And I personally strongly disagree with that approach. We, I would rather use intravascular imaging either IVUS or OCT to measure first and then decide about your um, um, strategy. Rather, as Florian just mentioned, rather downsize your balloon and upsize the pressure and crack the lesion first. And to be honest, I, what you didn't mention there, we're not too afraid about dissections because there are many ways to handle them afterwards. And um, therefore, um, just, but as Flora mentioned, don't oversize the balloon at uh, as the begin at the start, because then you've got a problem. The uh, the section might spirals down, and you have to uh, end up stenting the whole vessel. And importantly, Matthias, also you mentioned it. I think intravascular imaging. I mean, 
Abbott is very happy about us, but we um, because we use so many OCT catheters with this. And, and, and I think this is also important because we size our balloons according to OCT. And I think this is also, also important. So it's, I mean, treating patients with drug balloons is expensive, but it's good quality. It's not cheap. If you want to have a cheap system, then you don't use this kind of, because of course the cost for PCI is, is higher because you use more intravascular imaging, in our case at least, then you use uh, the drug balloons are more expensive. You the lesion preparation becomes a bit more expensive because you are, um, but I think it pays off because if you uh, creating a full metal jacket will maybe be cheap in the short term, but then expensive in the long term. I so have, let's may, may I ask okay? just one uh, question because uh, this concept is very interesting for me. And uh, if you create uh, this section right open the artery widely there are some some cases for ex for sure there must be one or two cases when you have to stand for example and tell me uh, because you always do uh, OCT uh, in these cases and when you decide to leave and when you decide to uh, to stand uh, that's a very good question uh, you know the problem is OCT will not help you make this decision because old OCT will create more um, more uncertainty because on OCT it will look very ugly um, and I think this is yeah and I think that's why I think I use the OCT much more for the lesion preparation sizing the balloon understanding the lesion rather than deciding if I should put a stent or not we decide angiographically um, and by, of course, patient pain, uh, ECG, and we decide uh, on a consensus basis. So we are three guys in our center doing a lot of drug and balloon use. And usually we show the result to each other and say, would you leave this? And if you have a 2-1, then you leave it. If you have a uh, for, for leaving, if you have a 3-0 for stenting, then you put a stent. But this right. is a rather, I mean, uh, it's, I, I think I'm not there yet to, 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 um, to be very robust and say, okay, leave it. But when I saw what I saw yesterday, what Colombo left in that life case, I have to say, well, I have to leave much more. <laughs> 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 <laughs>